Scriptures are read, the first scriptures in Romans 1, and in your church pew Bibles, if you want to follow along, it's on page 865, and we're reading verses 8 to 12. This is a part of a letter from Paul, who was sent out to preach the good news. Let me say, first of all, that your faith in God is becoming known throughout the world. How I thank God through Jesus Christ for each one of you. God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night, I bring you and your needs in prayer to God, whom I serve with all my heart by telling others the good news about his Son. One of the things I always pray for is the opportunity, God willing, to come at last to see you. For I long to visit you so I can share a spiritual blessing with you that will help you grow strong in the Lord. I am eager to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. In this way, each of us will be a blessing to the other. And this second scripture is found in your Bibles on page 940. It's Hebrews 10 verses 19 to 25. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. This is the new, life-giving way that Christ has opened up for us through the sacred curtain by means of his death for us. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's people, let us go right into the presence of God, with true hearts fully trusting him. For our evil consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Without wavering, let us hold tightly to the hope we say we have, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Think of ways to encourage one another to outbursts of love and good deeds. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage and warn each other, especially now that the day of his coming back again is drawing near. This is the word of the Lord. Well, it is the second Sunday of Lent, and last week we began a series called Soul Garden, which is looking at the comparison, or using as a comparison, the process of growing and nurturing seeds into fruit or crop or flowers and our spiritual life and the way that we likewise seek to be nurtured and to grow. And so this week we deal with community, the role of the Christian community specifically, uh, why it is important, why it is that the church today matters uh, and why it is that our being here together is of importance. Uh, This last week, uh, Bob Reek and I attended Presbytery, and at each Presbytery meeting there is an educational component, and this week we had the privilege of hearing from a man named the Reverend Dr. John Vissers, and he is one of the the people in the denomination I respect the most because he has a good sense of what is going on in Canadian society, where the church is at, and has some ideas about what it is that we can be doing. Plus, he's just a very kind man. And one of the things that he emphasized on Tuesday is something that we all know, which is that there is a perceptible shift in Canadian culture. We are less and less a Christian society than we may have previously been. Many of us, many of you, grew up in a time when to say you didn't believe in God would have been a huge risk, would have been something very socially unacceptable. I grew up in a time where uh, many of the parents who left the church as teenagers and young adults did not take their children to church, and so while my peers and friends watched the Smurfs, I learned about Jesus. Now, at the time, I felt hard done by, but in hindsight, Jesus probably has more lasting significance than the Smurfs, although they are enjoyable. (laughs) And one of the things that he used to point this out was statistics. And I don't really like to get out statistics, but it's interesting for a brief moment because it shows that whereas in 1971, 41% of Canadians identified as Protestant now in 2011, which is our last census, only 27% do. 
And whereas 47% used to identify as Catholic, 39% do. What is most interesting on that screen, though, is that since 1971, the rate, the number of people, the percentage of people in Canada who claim that they have no religious affiliation or belief has risen to nearly a quarter of our population, 24%. And this presents us with a very real challenge as the church, because we're no longer looking at bringing people back to church because they weren't here to start with, right? And it's not about reintroducing people to Jesus. My dad just made this comment. It's not reintroducing people to Jesus. It's saying, hey, this is Jesus. There is this guy, Jesus. And so it, we have choices to make as the Christian community. To decide that what we do together is completely irrelevant and unimportant and to get discouraged and defeat us and say, well, why do we even try? Because Canada's just going to be secular and there's going to be no room for the church anymore. We could do that. I don't particularly feel like that's life-giving and a cause you want to jump onto. Or we can say, all right, this is the reality. What do we do in the face of it? Is what we do together important? And if it is, then how do we interact with a world that's changing? I think as part of that, we have to first more fully understand the culture and the context we're in. And not just in terms of Ron Collins having to learn what Facebook is or Judy having to hop onto Instagram, not that kind of understanding, but really understanding what has happened in terms of shift in attitude and mindset. And uh, Charles Taylor, a Canadian philosopher and a Quebecois parliamentarian, well, he tried to be a parliamentarian, <laughs> uh, a politician, wrote a really interesting book called A Secular Age. It's 800 pages. Good news. You don't have to read it. I did some reading for you. <laughs> but basically, uh, what he identifies is three forms of secularism that he calls secularism one, two, and three, because that's handy. So I want to run past those really quickly and then talk about what the church how, how the church can counteract some of that and what we can do in response to it. Secular one refers to the decline of religion in the public square, right? Uh, we don't see it as much in small towns as, we use, as, as other places. I'm still allowed to, to pray at the Cenotaph as the chaplain, uh, but... But we see it in that uh, we, you can't pray in school, there, there isn't uh, prayers in the swearing-in ceremonies of general, uh, governor generals and things like that. We see that where the, well, I don't even really remember when it was a lot different than that, but, but there is less, we are less presumably Christian in, in the public square than we used to be, and we see that decline. Secular, too, sees a decline in religious belief and practice, that people generally are believing less the things of faith and practicing them less. That one is easier for us to address than secular one. And the third one is secular three, and this is where I really want us to think today, because secular three represents a change in religious consciousness. As I mentioned, many of my friends growing up, my friends who have 5, 10, 15-year-old children now, uh, did not grow up in church. And guess where they don't take their kids? Church. There are so many competing ideas about how we should live our life and what we should value most and what we should focus on. And for so many, for now fully a quarter of Canadians, God is not one of them. And faith is not one of them. And so we have seen this change in the consciousness, even in the awareness that faith and religion is an option. And so there is a challenge for us. There are all kinds of books being written about flashy ways to present the gospel. Uh, flashy ideas like your minister should be a cool guy in his mid-40s who wears a Hawaiian shirt and says yo a lot. There's all kinds of ideas out there that look at short-term solutions. But what we really need to do as the church is re-embrace our role as the Christian community. What it is that we are meant to do and what it is that we are already doing and how attractive that can be if we learn to communicate it well. I believe that the church and the Christian community can be an agent of change in our worlds if we are up to the challenge. 
A man named Karl Barth uh, speaks a lot about a number of things, including what the purpose of the Christian and the church is. And he says that our purpose, the reason that the church matters, is because we gather, we nurture, and we instill knowledge in one another in gathering people together. We uplift those people by encouraging them to a particular and a different way of life and to be transformed. And we present them, we send them into the world to present an alternative, the kingdom of God. And so as we go through these different aspects, I want to tell you a story along the way for each one. When I think of gathering, I am reminded of a man that many of you knew who grew up and spent his entire life in this church. And I had the privilege of visiting with him many times before his death in my short number of years as his minister. And all of his life was spent here. He was baptized here. He had memories of how the ladies that taught him Sunday school and the men that preached on Sundays in that time formed him and made him feel that this was a safe and a good place. When it was time to be married, he was married here. And he lived his life with his wife here. And when his wife died, he continued to stay here because this was his home and his place. And you filled his freezer so full that I ate at least three donated lasagnas (laughs) because he ran out of room. (laughs) This story is a beautiful story, I think, because it reminds us that as the community of faith, we can provide more than just something to do on Sunday morning, but for the, 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 the gaggle of kids, the great group of fun and amazing children that we have, and for each other, and for anyone new to the faith, we can provide a place where we learn to love God and to be loved by him, where we know that we belong and that everything about us is wonderful. And this sets the ground for all of our life and how we live. It reminds us that we are rooted in and growing in our likeness of Christ, and it can encourage us. As the Christian community, when so many people feel rooted and disconnected and like they don't belong, we offer a place to belong. But not even just to belong, to matter and to be valued and loved and to be able to squirm and to be able to cry and to be able to celebrate and all of those things. And this is really important. The author of the book of Hebrews, which Ruth read for us this morning, is writing to a church that is severely persecuted. The society and the culture around them hate them. They are, they are torturing them. They are rejecting them. They are mistreating them. And his advice, the author's advice to them is, don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. It would be easier at that point for them to stop identifying as being part of the church so that they didn't keep getting tortured and persecuted and mistreated, right? But what the author says is, but don't do that because it's so important for you to be together. It's important to come together and to learn from one another, to be part of the environment of growth and development where your roots can really sink in, where the roots of faith can be nurtured and developed. And the reason that that's so important, oh, sorry, (laughs) is because the church community, the Christian community at its best, is a place where we are uplifted, where we are encouraged towards a way of life and to a, a way of life that affects everything we do in the public square, a way of life that shows a transformation. One of the beautiful privileges that I had, although it didn't feel like one at the time, was to run a youth group that the Children's Aid Society became aware of. Because as the Children's Aid Society became aware of my youth group, which was a nice community of good social values at the very least, a lot of gospel truth, but let's be honest, they were interested in the fact that I taught the kids not to swear and beat each other up. They started sending me youth. And then those youth started bringing their friends, and then they started bringing their friends. And before I knew it, on a weekly basis, I was touching base with five parole officers, uh, giving character references at two (laughs) criminal court cases, (laughs) uh, and interacting with various social workers in the area. 
assuring them that, assuring the probation officers that the kids that said they were coming to youth group actually showed up at youth group and weren't, you know, using youth group as an excuse to go and continue breaking the law and all these sort of things. And one of the people that came to me first, one of the first ones, my, my induction by fire, <laughs> was a young man named Carl. And I spoke with Carl, and he's okay with me talking about this. Carl came from a family where the solution to everything was to drink or beat the crap out of someone. That was your response to everything. It didn't have to be big stuff. That was my seat, and you took it. I'm going to pound you. You looked at me wrong. I'm going to beat you up. So he had a parole officer. Probably no surprise. And when Carl started coming to the youth group, the parole officer said, this is never going to work. You can be as nice as you like to this kid, but you're never going to love him into change. And I said, you're right, but God might. And over time, and over several times of being told he had to take a three-week break, think about things, and he could come back. And over years, myself and the other leaders saw God do wonderful things in Carl. Not because of us, but because we made a space for him and God did the work. When he first came, we would say, there's Carl hide the knives, half as a joke and half as a truth. By the last year of his time with us at the youth group, Carl played Jesus in our Monday Thursday service because he begged to. He wanted desperately to be Jesus and to say to the criminal on his left in a drama, you will be with me today in paradise. Patience, a dedicated group of older women who cooked for him every week and for his friends. Love, the ability to keep coming back, changed Carl's life. And we kept him out of jail. And when I think of that story, I think of the beauty of what the Christian community can do as it encourages and uplifts people and encourages transformation. As we preach to each other and live out together forgiveness and patience and kindness and love and gentleness and goodness and self-control, it can make a difference in the lives of other people. People who have been in church their whole life, like my first example, or people who are new to it. It is as we live and move together as the Christian church and uplift one another that we begin to change the world around us. And so Paul prays, or the author in Hebrews, rather, encourages us to think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Not just acts of love and good works in the Christian community, but in the world. But this community is where we incubate the the courage and the ability and the desire to do those good works and those acts of love. In Romans, Paul says that one of the things that he has prayed for over and over is the ability to go and to visit the church in Rome. Why? Not so that he can give them all kinds of theological instructions. I mean, he does do that. There's an entire letter in the book of Acts, and it's pretty heavy theologically. But he says, I long to visit you so I can bring you some spiritual gift that will help you grow strong in the Lord. When we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. There is a mutuality in the church and in the Christian community that is of benefit to us and to the world as we take it with us. This encouragement to live in a different and a particular way, according to the principles of the kingdom of God, which says that we love everyone, including our neighbor, and that we look after the ones who are most vulnerable and marginalized. When we get together on a Sunday morning, when we get together for perking, when we get together to peel potatoes and talk for Bible study and for all kinds of other things, we teach each other things. And we remind each other that being a Christian is not a solitary practice. We are not alone in holding on to and expressing our faith, even if it feels like it sometimes. In being together, God gives us the gift of learning and growing so that we can show each other and encourage each other and move and motivate each other to live and walk following him. It takes a lot of work to live out the gospel. It takes a lot of work to live out the principles of God's kingdom where last is first and greatness is found in service. There's no denying that the gospel asks us to be different. And there's no denying that we need one another's help in having the courage to live it. 
because not only is the Christian community important for nurturing us and gathering us and uplifting us, but another important aspect of our Christian community is leaving it, going into the world, coming back to get refreshed, going into the world and living, coming back for more encouragement and going out into the world again and coming back, right? It's that constant thing. You don't fill your car up with gas once and then hope you can drive for a year, right? And so there is this aspect of sending, the church sending and going. But for what purpose? To show the world how right we are? How flashy we are? How fantastic we are? No. We send each other out and we go out together so that we can continue gathering, right? So that it becomes a circle. So that we can continue gathering others into the community so that they can learn the ways of God's kingdom. Now, the thing is, it's really tempting just to gather people that look like us, right? Middle class, affluent well, we're all white, let's be honest, right? Uh, Grew up with some kind of faith, uh, social norms in place, uh, reasonable moral choices, or hiding the ones that weren't. You know, it's easy to want to just go and gather those that are like us. But what we see in the gospel is is that a truly healthy Christian church and community looks at welcoming anyone, the poor, the sick, the blind, the immigrant, the the previous criminal, everyone, so that they can be transformed as we have been by the love of God. And that is how we respond to secular three, that change in Christian religious conscience, rather, is by going and saying, hey, are some things in society not working for you? Do you feel like you're forgotten and overlooked and that nobody cares whether you have enough food for you and your family? Well, guess what? The church does. We care. God cares. Or, hey, are you really tired of working 24-7, 365 days a year to still barely make it? Is that working for you? Or do you think something else might be more important? Hey, the church has some thoughts on that, on what matters most in life, affluence or faith in God. We have a great gift in our faith. And because most of you, like me, have had that gift all your life, we forget how wonderful it is. But we have the gift of knowing that there is a God who cares about us and, and calls us to a better and a different way of life. And it's our privilege to extend that gift to other people. We can't assume anymore that our friends and neighbors understand us when we talk about faith, when we talk about the gospel or being saved. Saved from what, someone asked me once. Try to explain that to someone with no concept of sin. And so sometimes the language that we use is going to have to change. We're going to have to be creative and think about new ways to communicate constant truths. All of this relates to Lent because the season of Lent is a season of transformation. We have committed ourselves to 40 days of intentional transformation by God. And one of the ways that he continually transforms us is in how we think and how we speak and in how we act. As the Church of Christ, as Knox Presbyterian Walkerton, as a beautiful community of faith that I love more deeply than you may know, I hope we will remember that God has created us as something beautiful, and he desires to use us in very positive and life-giving ways in this community, even more than he already is. He desires to take the good that we are doing and expand it, so that more and more people can be gathered unto him to know that his love for them is constant and real and and unwavering, that they have value and that how they live and the conditions of their life matter to him and to us. It is my prayer that as we continue to be transformed in our own personal lives during Lent, we will also seek transformation as a community so that we can, as a Christian community that gathers and nurtures and uplifts and sends out, make even more of a difference in our world for Christ who died on the cross for our sin because he loved us. And not just because he loved us, but because he loved all of them too. So it is my prayer that over these 40 days of transformation, our love for them will continue to grow, not just in our hearts, but in our actions and in our desires to serve them. 
we are going to sing in a minute, they will know we are Christians by our love. That is very true. May it be our prayer that that is the case here in Walkerton and beyond. Amen. <laughs> 